So welcome, everybody. I've really been looking forward to having Isabel with us. You know that the whole first year of um, Help the Helpers, that Isabel was here every week and, and, uh, and helping us with this project. And then she had to go back to work. And so now it's only on days when she doesn't have to go to work. Um, and Isabel, I'm so touched that your day off, you'll come and, um, and talk to us uh, rather than all the millions of things that you could be doing this morning. So um, welcome to everybody. Just want to remind you that at 10 this morning, there'll be a little um, meeting of uh, the planning committee or whatever we call ourselves that will be um, guiding uh, the Help the Helpers project. So if you can join us from 10 to 30, please do that. So let's take a breath together. Monday morning. Yes. And the warmest welcome to Isabel. Uh, Isabel said, I, I don't want to introduce, I don't want you to introduce me uh, in relation to what I've done, but how I show up and uh, how Isabel shows up uh, would take me the whole session to introduce. Um, and I think that um, that many of you know Isabel's amazing spirit and beautiful smile and the way that she puts things and her her heart and her passion and her dedication and um, her poetry, her spirit. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have her with us this morning, but I would say that uh, Isabel has worked uh, tirelessly or maybe sometimes tired um, as, a, as a member of the um, community empowerment team. And she is a soon to be coordinator for the Focusing Institute and lots of other things, but we won't list them all today. So, Isabel, we're very happy to have you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, as Lynn say, um, this group, this community is very close to my heart. And yet I can't come all the time because I work in a school setting. And if you work in a school, or if you have children, or if you had siblings, eight o'clock is the witching hour. <laughs> it's yeah. when everything happens, right? Um, and so I can't really be available during those times, except when um, there's no school. But I, I see the, I often see the, the announcement and something in my heart gets awakened about the conversation, about the who will be there, and just the, the holding that takes place in this community. And so miss you all, some of you I've seen before, some of you I haven't. Um, what I would say about me is that I am Isabel, I am the daughter of Isabel, Martinez and the granddaughter of Dolores Martinez and the great granddaughter of um, also another Dolores and Isabel Regalado. And, um, and that's my lineage. And I named the woman in my lineage um, because there was a point in my life when um, I was like, oh my God, why, why am I being called Isabel? And I really didn't want to use my name. So I always use my middle name. And it wasn't until I went into my 30th that I started using Isabel as my given name and being comfortable around it. And, um, and that actually came out of loss, right? That, that sort of like stepping into that came out of loss. And so I wanted to share that. Um, 
I don't know that we have, I think all of you kind of know each other, but um, I like to presence people into a space. And by that, what I mean is that the body may be here. The little square may be here, right? But what do I need to bring all who I am to this space, to this moment? And so if you can take a moment to notice, just notice, what do you need to bring all of who you are into this moment? To really allow yourself to welcome all of your parts. Maybe the professional self, the parent, the worker, the neighbor, all of who you are. Just allowing everyone to show up. And then if it feels right for you to welcome your ancestor, to welcome nature, to welcome the wind, the water, the earth, fire, right? Whatever it is you need to do to have that happen for you, just take a moment there to do it. Maybe it's noticing the breath, noticing sounds, Noticing rhythm. Noticing touch. How's your body touching the chair, the bed, the ground? And truly, truly welcoming yourself and others in a good way. Mm. Great. So, um, so my intention for today was to, you know, I, I um, introduce myself when my lineage of my mother's side of the family. And part of the reason for that is the name. But the other part of the reason for that is that almost everyone on my mother's side of the family has some leaning into um, healing in some way or another, even though they didn't call themselves um, psychologists, social worker, doctors, they may have called themselves curanderas, parteras, and that's healers and, and midwife. And so for me, I would not have been here had it not been for them, right? Whether I was aware of it or not. Uh, so the contribution was generous and tremendous. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna read a poem and that's what we're gonna start with, right? And this is from um, an Indian, Poet, Akil Katao, and um, and um, he's an activist, a queer person, and this is what he says about grief. Grief is the least biodegradable of objects. Do not bury it. Stash it between your fingers and in those inconsolable hours, let it run. There will be nights when even steel dissolves it, dissolves it with your torch. 
So there will be nights when even steel dissolves with your touch. And just allow that, those words to, you know, the least biodegradable grief. I, I never thought of grief of that way. And yet we move in a, in a space and in a society where grief is expected to somehow magically disappear. Um, we hear the words, well, get over it. They're in a better place. They lived a good life. Um, everyone dies. It was going to happen. God knows best. And I mean, we can go on and on. And I don't know if you have phrases of your own that you have heard in relationship to grief and grieving that you want to put in the chat. You can go ahead and do that. Um, but today, what I wanted to sort of like be with is grief as a path to liberation, as a path to movement, as a path to transformation. Right, usually we don't keep grief company in that way. Um, grief sometimes shows up and, it, and, and it's carried as a heavy burden. And so part of what we'll do today, um, just so if you need kind of like a roadmap, um, is that we'll talk a little bit about grief and what it means. Um, we'll grief. do- I'm grief today. Oh, grief. <laughs> Hi guys, <laughs> I love that. I love that. It was it was it kind of like grief? Let me run the other way. Was it kind of like that? Oh, grief? Let me come and keep it company. <laughs> How was it, Lenoa? What kind of reaction was it? It it was keeping you company. Sorry, I didn't know I was unmuted. <laughs> uh, but you know that's the thing about Zoom, right? We we have um, transform ourselves and then. I believe that the Zoom company put a little tiny, tiny, tiny print say, you must speak when you are muted. You must have, I call it show and tell. Somebody's gonna show up and tell something that you didn't wanna be known, right? That somebody's gonna come in, do something. And so I have learned to just be with all of that. But anyway, um, thank you for that. So we, we going to, the roadmap, it's going to be to um, some of the uh, formal definitions of grief, right? Because sometimes it's like, oh, my God, what is that? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the different kinds of grief. And then we're going to do two, two or possibly two things. One is going to be to, to unpack a piece of grief. And another one is going to be to be with someone while we um, lay out or put down or set down our grief and that person is gonna be our witness, right? Um, and so I'm gonna um, see if I can show you um, a something before we even start. And um, uh, bear with me because today, so I have three computers and sometimes I take one to work and other times I have one here and then I have one that I carry back and forth. And so the one I carry back and forth is the one I left at work. <laughs> so I don't have that one with me today and it's where I have all of these things. Um, so I wanna show you something and we're gonna do this in, um, you know, in a focusing way, but also in a, in a way that we presence in ourselves. And the invitation is for you to take care of yourself, right? To take care of yourself, to bring awareness to yourself, to what's happening for you, to what's showing up. And if you need to, to, um, to turn away, to turn off the camera, uh, to get up and move, uh, that you do that that you actually do do that. And so that's the invitation today, right? And so I'm gonna show you a couple of things and then 
um, I just want you to uh, look at that and you know, there's no right or wrong. It's just looking at something. And um, let me see. Uh, so that's January 6th, 2021. Just take a moment. Look at that. And see what it invokes. What comes forward for you. And we just watching thing there's really nothing to do with these things right noticing your body noticing what show up when you saw that noticing what was there all we're doing here it's noticing we're not fixing we're not changing anything we're just noticing okay Let's see if I can share this one now. This is very interesting exploration of how I share. Mm -hmm. Isabel, we Isabel, don't see Isabel. that. Ah, somebody's echoing. It's, um, you can see this one, right? Mm. Okay. So let me show this one then. Um, um, Christine. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. I may send it to Christine, but you guys saw this. I don't have to. So have a bodily felt sense of this. I'm not going to show you this. But have a bodily felt sense. What was your reaction when you heard that the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade? I'm not asking you what side of the law you are. But what was your felt sense of that? And then notice that. Just take a moment there. Now we're going to go back to what's your felt sense? What was your reaction when you heard about George Floyd? Take a moment there. So now this is going to require that everyone does this. So if you um, can be close to turning off your camera, I'm going to ask a few questions. And if it applies to you, you're going to turn off your camera. So everybody should be in gallery view, right? So you can see all the square. So everybody's in gallery view, so you can see everybody at the same time. Not speak of you, gallery view, right? And I'm going to ask a few questions. If he applies to you, you're going to turn off your camera. If he doesn't apply, you leave your camera on, okay? Have you ever lost your keys? <laughs> okay, turn, turn your camera back on. Have you ever missed a fly? <laughs> mm -hmm. Turn it back on. Have you lost a pet? If you have a pet. Mm. Have you lost someone dear to you? I think at this point, everybody camera should be off unless you are very, very um, obsessional person. Have you have a plant that you lost that you, you were caring for and all suddenly you die and you didn't know how, what happened, you were doing everything? Mm 
So what we want to notice here is that loss is universal. Loss is universal. It doesn't matter what kind of loss is. The body reaction to loss is the same in some way because the, the biological reaction to loss is the same regardless. It doesn't quantify it like, oh, this person was close to me, but this person was distant to me. Um, and so loss is loss. And sometimes what happened, and this is a bit of, um, in some country, I know in my country, loss is quantified. Um, if it's a mother or a father or someone very close to you, you're going to wear black for a certain amount of time, right? So I'm from the Dominican Republic. If it's my mother, if it's my father, if it's my brother, my sister, an immediate family member, there's a prescribed way in which I'm going to grieve that, right? I'm going to wear black and I'm going to do it for a certain amount of time two years, three years, four years. And that's how we externally will let people know that we are grieving, right? Um, if it's a cousin or someone I know, if I feel really connected to them, I may wear something that is called uh, medio luto, which translates to like half grieving. I don't know that you can half grieve someone or that you can be half pregnant, but that's, that's a term for that, right? That you can grieve in that way. Um, in a kind of like halfway grieving. So every culture has different way and different things that they um, are with around loss, right? So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about and touching with, it's from my own personal work. It's from work that I've done with Shirley Turka, uh, Métis Women from Canada, who teaches about um, indigenous, the indigenous way of being with loss and with trauma. It's what I learned from Pauline Boss, and some of you may have heard from her. Um, and some of the pieces are also from um, Weiser Cornell in terms of clearing space and being with something in a focusing way. So. So that's the intention to sort of like bring all of those pieces together. So grief, it's, um, it's described as deep sorrow or mental distress. We all experience sadness. We all uh, feel sad when something happened, but we don't stay there. We just feel it in that moment maybe, and then we move on or we um, find some way of letting it go. And the mourning is the process of moving through that grief, right? And, and grief, it's like water. You, you can't hold it. And sometimes we, we think of grief and we want to hold on to it, but you just can't hold it. It sort of like sips out. Um, and there are different kinds of grief. And um, this is one thing that, Pauline Boss says about grief. And I thought that this was appropriate because we are dealing right now with migrants that are coming here or to the United States. By here, I mean the United States. And this is from an interview with Kristen Tippen. And I will send this to Lynn so Lynn can send it to you. But Kristen Tippen says to um, Pauline Boss in that interview that she was talking about homesickness was an essential part of her family culture. And to that, Pauline Boss responds that she thinks that for all immigrant family, all immigrant family, and we all have come here from somewhere, right? Uh, even though now we kind of say, well, I'm a New Yorker, I'm, a, I'm from the United States, I'm an American. We all have come here from somewhere. And so she goes on to say that all immigrant family experience this sort of sense of loss and sadness periodically or ongoing. And my own experience around that kind of loss is when I came to this country. I came to this country when I was 12. And 
no one was talking about the loss that I was experiencing. They were only talking about how grateful I should be that I was in the United States. And yeah, um, I'm sorry, this is my daughter. Let me just tell Oh, I mean, a thing. Hold on a second, don't hang up. It's my daughter and my granddaughter, the morning call. It's every day. <laughs> Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. So it's the morning call that I get every day. Um, and you see how even in grief, we can have joy, which is the other thing we're going to talk about. But anyway, when I came to this country, everybody was just talking about how grateful I should be, how happy I should be. And yeah, there was a deep sadness in my heart, right? And that sadness was going unrecognized. No one really um, knew about it because I kept it very close to my heart and I didn't share it. And I was also 12, right? Uh, who's going to listen to a 12 year old? But that's sometimes how grief is manifested. We think of grief as an individual process. And grief, it's also a collective process, right? That we can experience together. And so grief doesn't have a prescribed stage or, you know, you know how people talk about the stages of grief. You can be in one place one day and in another place the next day. So it doesn't really follow a linear path, right? It, it can be circular. It can come out and come back in, right? And so um, one of the things about grief is that it's, it's, it's really mental distress. It's, it's, it's really weighing you down. And I don't know if you notice when I'm saying it's weighing you down because a lot of time it feels like that, like you're carrying something, you're carrying something heavy. And, um, and then the mourning, please, the, the, it's the process of being with that grief, the action that you take, the external responses. Like I say, for me, in the Dominican Republic, is it's kind of like wearing the... Um, the external black, you wear all black or you wear black and white or you wear all white, but that's a way to let people know that you are grieving. You have to have a way to let people know that you're grieving. Grief sometimes can be, um, the, the grief you experience can be determined by who the person was or the event, right? Um, it can be the nature of the attachment, like how close you were to this person. Um, it can also be um, the way the person died. Sometimes if it's a sudden, and you hear this quite often, oh, the time came too soon. They were so young. This was so tragic, right? And it changes, right? And so grief is determined on how we relate to it by some of those pieces. Then the circumstances may also influence how we relate to it. Was it a multiple loss, right? We, all of us experience that grief when we heard about the, about the tragedy, right? I don't know anybody there, but how could we not experience that? Or most recently, the Thailand tragedy, right? We don't know. I don't know anybody there, but I, I experienced that grief as if it was my own as a mother, right? Grief can have historical factor, which is what I showed you when I showed you that 2021. Um, you know, January 6, 2021 may live in, in the memory of many people as a, as a before or after, which is sometimes how we mark grief before this happened and the after this happened. It may also have social implication. George Floyd, a whole movement came behind that, right? Trevor Martin, Black Lives Matter came out of that. And so grief can also have social implication. And you, when I say to you, what was your reaction 
to the um, the change in the Supreme Court to to reverse abortion, right? So the social impl implication now for that is the movement that some people have been they being carried forward by that by that sense of wanting to take action. And I bring that in because a lot of times we think of grief, it's just that's it, we're done, um, we're overwhelmed by this grief, but grief can really be a path to liberation and to action. It can really create that transformative place where we can open up to something else, right? And so, Grief, it's not always a bad thing in air quotes here. Grief can really open the door to creating a something, to seeing a something else. And I don't know, but I'm going to use the language that we use in Buddhism. Those have I heard, right? We, when we're going to say something that the Buddha say, I'm going to say, those have I heard that uh, Jean Gendling say that even when we don't know it, there's always a forward movement taking place. And we are, may not be aware of it, but there's a forward movement always taking place. And so in grief, it's the same. Even when we may be thinking we're stuck, we're not moving through it, there's always a movement that's happening. And, and that's the piece about the focusing attitude, the gentleness of it. And so I'm, I'm going to name a few things about grief and, you know, just notice if it resonates for you. So as a woman, as a woman, um, I always used to say, I can't wait to the day I don't have my period anymore. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to throw a party. That's what I'm going to do. And then when it actually happened, there was such a huge sense of loss. There was a sense of, oh, one of the things that define me as a woman, it's no longer here. But I wasn't going around telling people about this because this is a, a personal grieving. It's a personal grief, one that we don't share, one we don't talk about it right? Because there's some rules around which kind of grief is okay to share. Another grief that is also very personal, um, it's when women have a miscarriage. When a family, I'm not saying just a woman, but a family has a miscarriage. Often, there's no talking about it. It's a loss that is kept in silence that people uh, are with in a personal way without sharing it um, with other people. And so that's another kind of loss that is very private. And yeah, it's a big loss for that family, right? Because it's the hope and aspiration have been lost. And so that's another kind of loss that is kind of private and not shared. There's different kinds of grief. It's, and, and one of the things that um, we also don't talk about is this anticipatory loss. When someone we know, their health has deteriorated and they are critically ill and we know that the loss is going to come. And so we're anticipating the loss. We're making amends. We, you know, uh, maybe putting the affairs in order, but that's another thing that people don't talk about, right? We, we just go through the motion, we take care, we become caregiver and that take precedence over the grief. And so we start to care for this person by not allowing ourselves to grieve. And then there's another kind of loss and Pauline Boss talks a lot about that and it's ambiguous loss. This is the kind of loss that someone either it's lost, you know, they disappear, you don't know. Uh, September 11, survivors may be experiencing that because if you don't do the ritual, if you don't have the ceremonies that you do when someone passes away, it creates a sense of one day they may show up when someone disappears, right? 
Um, and so ambiguous loss is a it's a very big kind of loss and and it, it doesn't really allow for the working it through. It sort of like freezes and paralyzes you. It paralyzes the person. And it's much more difficult to move through that because there's not a clear um, ending to this. There's not a clear ending. And so it's, it's hard to be with that. And um, another kind of loss is, and, and you know, this may seem trivial right now to some people. And again, people start to quantify and compare loss. But since 2020, some people have lost a job, right? And haven't regained a job. And then there's some people are working from home. And one of the losses there is the loss of socialization with your peers, right? The, the loss of having sort of like a real sense of um, being productive. You're getting up in the morning and you're going to work and you're working around other people. So that's a big loss. You heard the term, my my office husband, my office wife, my office sister. So now we don't have that, right? Um, and that's a loss that people are not talking about. Instead, people are talking about the joy that everybody's feeling because they don't have to go to work, right? And so this is sometimes um, we kind of like throw a big blanket over something and forget that for other people, the experience may be different. Well, the other piece about loss, and, and I'll, I'll say this and then we'll do a something because this is about doing a something rather than listening to a something. The other piece about loss is that a whole community can experience a loss. And it doesn't have to necessarily be the loss of a person, but it can be the loss of their ability to practice their religion. Right? when they move from one place to another. It can be the loss of their language. If you come somewhere and no longer you can speak your language, you now have to learn the new language. A whole community can, um, again, the wilder community had that sort of like collective experience of loss. And that is a much, much, not bigger or smaller, but everyone is experiencing that loss. So we're going to take a pause here. And I want you to just notice your body and what's there right now. Just take a moment. If anything has come, it is anything present. And you can just go ahead on a mute and and that's it, you don't have to ask permission. What's present for you right now? Someone wrote in the chat that they cannot do focusing with grief and they cannot keep grief company. And that is so hard. It is hard. And yet it's an experience that we all have, right? You saw how we started. I say, who has lost the key? lost this, lost the plane, you know, we all have experienced loss, all of us. And yeah, it's one of the most difficult things to talk about. And if you are a clinician, if you are partner to someone, or if you're doing focusing, whatever way, if you're a helper, and you cannot be with your not only with your own loss, but the loss that someone else is bringing, that's a hard place to be. And so anything for anyone before I actually give you something to do around this. Oh, okay. I'm going to show you something. And all you're going to need for this <clears throat> is a piece of paper. Okay, a blank piece of paper. You don't need nothing extravagant. So I'm going to show you a few ones that I've done. I'm just going to show you. So this is one piece I did in Griff. You can see it. And it looks like a pie, like a piece of pie. That one has words. Then this is another one I did. And it's also a pie, but no words, just lots of different things. 
Then this is another one I did. And it's also a pie. But no words. This is another one I did. And this is based on the work from Shirley Torka. And we are not going to do that in its entirety. Um, yeah, Lindsay, thank you. So yes, that that's that um so that uh Lindsay wrote curiosity about Pauline Boss work. Curious to hear if ambiguous loss is overlapping with the disenfranchised grief. And you know what I would say is that the, there's the intersectionality of all these pieces. And I think that sometimes we want to compartmentalize loss and grief. And grief, it's just, um, it touches everything. It touches everywhere. It's like water. It's like the image that comes for me. It's like the waves coming to the sand, right? It doesn't choose and pick which grain of salt sand it touches it just touches right and so yes um the San Francisco community um are overlapping with that place of ambiguous loss like not knowing how come I can have food how come I can you know it's in, in my own experience um growing up this is something that was revealed to me in in this work recently um I didn't know I was poor. I just didn't know that <laughs> because uh, we have food, we have clothes, but I didn't know we were poor, but we were poor and we were constantly moving. We were moving all the time because my mother couldn't afford to pay the rent. And so we live kind of like a nomadic life. We'll be here and then get back on the rent and move move here and get back on the rent and move. And I didn't realize until later on in my life, like as recent as that few weeks ago, yeah. that this, even though I didn't have language for it, was getting inside my body. And I was relating to my life now from a place of lack all the time. It was a place of lack. So let me let me tell you what we're gonna do. All you're gonna need is a piece of paper. And I done this in a piece of paper as big as this. I'll take a I'll I'll make a circle and then I'll I make a pie. So this is um this is how we're gonna do this. I'm gonna give you a couple of pieces that you're gonna notice in a focusing way. And you're gonna see if there's any grief around that, right? And so I'll give you a few, I'll name a few things. I'll also type them in the chat or I don't know if somebody else can do it, but I could type it. Um, so you're just gonna think about, you're not gonna do anything with it in terms of doing too much or too little, but I wanna show you a blank one. This is a blank pie and you, just do it yourself in a piece of paper. If you don't do a pie, you can just do, you just can write it out. Don't get caught up in the form. The form is not important. That's not what's important. It's the process, okay? So I'm gonna name a couple of things in relationship to grief. And then you say, you're gonna maybe write a sentence or two or don't write nothing, just make a drawing, whatever way it works for you, right? And so these are things that sometimes impact grief or are interrelated with grief. And I'm using this language here, okay? But this pie, this pie was created by Shirley Turco. And I'm not using it in this way here. I'm using a form of it. We do this in a different training. This is an, a form of it we're using. So think about these pieces and notice if you have grief around this. Racism, sexism, any kind of ism. Is there a piece of grief for you around that? And you can just write it, 
yes, no, maybe so, just so we can kind of like work with that. Is there grief for you around the political state of this country? So I'm going to write them in the thing. So if you want to refer to it, you can look back. Is there grief for you around illness? I'm going to type them in the chat. Is there grief for you around a specific situation? And a situation can be, you know, I don't have my job, I retire, which is another big piece of grief, even though people think that when people retire, it's all fun and game. Sometimes that is experienced as a major loss because who we have been, all of a sudden the shifts, right? So situational grief. Is there grief that is intergenerational, right? So, um, and this is my grief around my uncle took his life when I was eight and he took his life on January 1st. And so every year, January 1st, this is a long time ago. I'm talking 50 plus year. There's a sense of that loss, right? So that's an intergenerational loss because it's been years and all the people and, right? Is there grief around other people's losses, right? So we name the Ubaldo tragedy, we name the Thailand tragedy, just to name a few. If we wouldn't have time to name all of it, but it's the grief around that too. Seasonal grief, right? So I I don't have seasonal affective disorder, but when the summer is over, I am grieving the summer because I love summer. I love everything about it. The stinkiness of the summer in a subway ride, the smell of the ocean, everything about the summer. And so as soon as summer ends, I'm like, oh my God, I fall into that grieving of missing that, right? So seasonal, you may grieve winter if you're a winter person. And so let's just use those few. We don't have to use all of them. And these are the ones you're going to take with you the next time we, we go and we're going to break away. So just notice and what's going on as I name those. What came for you? What came for you as I name those? Racism, sexism, situational grief, intergenerational grief, seasonal grief. Political grief. I named vicarious grief. I didn't use that word, but it's vicarious grief. The grief that we experience when something is happening with someone else is not directly us, but it can be our client, it can be our neighborhood, it can be our country. What came for you? And so we're going to pause this because we're going to take a break, I think. Post this, hold that. I know some people will have to go, but if you have to go, because we're going to come back and be in Daya, and I'll tell you what we'll do so you not be surprised. And then if you want to leave, you can do that, and it's okay. But what we're going to do in the Daya when we come back, we're going to work with our partner, and it's going to be something like this. Um, can I ask um, Dorothy? Can you partner up with me um, just so people can see? So you're going to need to unmute. Okay. And I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about is grief around hormones for me. That's my grief. 
today. Okay? And all you're going to say to me, nothing else, whenever you can, you're going to intercede and you're going to ask me if there's more. That's all. And we're going to, let's do this. We'll, we'll do one minute of this. Okay? Um, so, the grief that I've been experiencing about the hormone, it's that um, with my change of life and I gain a lot of weight. Mm. And um, I gain a lot of weight and that had in, has impacted my, my body, my form. Is there more? Let me see. I think that the other thing, and I can sense that there's a sadness around this. I sort of missing my youth in this. Like it feels like that's my body change. I'm also aging. Is there more? Mm. Just as you asked that, I felt like a kind of like a release. And um, and the image that came when you asked that this time is the image of trees when fall is coming. That the leaves begin to change. And that sort of like made me feel like, oh, so I am like a tree. I'm changing. There are parts of me that are changing but I'm still the same. I'm still grounded in the same space. And that brought a bit of, yeah, I can be with this hormonal thing changing and in a different way if I think of it in that way. So that's that, is that helpful to know how you're gonna go into it? You're just gonna go into it in that way. So the person, and, and the person, when we come back, will pick whatever, whether you want to do, or you can pick another piece of grief. It doesn't have to be any one of the ones I named. What you don't have to do is share the grief. Does that make sense? Like, what is it? But in a focusing way, share the, the parts of it that you're sitting with. Share what's uh, alive for you around that experience. And... Um, what feels comfortable for you to share. And then we'll do one more piece, which is how to move this out of the body. And anybody could go, I think the way you work it's that you just unmute yourself and say something. Isabel, this is Shashi, good morning. You know, I don't know if I'm just being fake or um, uh, too full of myself. But I think that I am going to keep grief as one of my spices in my spice box of life. And I am not going to take it out of my spice box, but I'm not going to overuse it for the time that I have left. I am going to uh, uh, have equanimity about it. And uh, this is, I don't know if I'm like, fluffing you know i'm just saying that but <laughs> I, I, I that is my <laughs> i that don't is think, my wish <laughs> yeah sashi i don't think you are remember the poem that i read at the beginning by akio katao it says yes. grief is the least biodegradable of objects yes. not bury it yeah. stash it between your fingers and in those inconsolable hours let it run let it yeah. run yeah. and I love the way you frame it that it's one of your spices and from time to time we just got to take it out yes. and let it sit in our life because our grief um, it's wisdom also right? it's wisdom it's also wisdom um, yeah. yes I will post it <laughs> I will send everything to 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 yeah. Lynn, um, really appreciating Sashi 
um because i think that sometimes in 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 we um you know animals grief and and i didn't talk about that but that's a movie i'll send it to i'll send it to lynn but animals grieve and yeah. Like elephants is the one that we know yes. more about, yeah. mm -hmm. but every animal grief. Um, my little dog, which is um, a Pekingese, uh, mm -hmm. when someone comes to visit, mm -hmm. she's overly excited, overly mm -hmm. excited. And then when people leave, um, she doesn't want to eat. She just in the corner, you know, looking out the window, hoping that the person will come back. Um, and so animals grieve also. It's it's a natural thing. Um, anyone else, anything else that came for you in the diet? Um, yes. Hi. Oh, somebody. Well, go ahead. Somebody's going to say something. It was me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say that uh, I'm going to talk to Lynn about a future topic is life lessons that we learn from good or bad experiences. And I learned a wonderful lesson from the grief I experienced with uh, my parents dying within a year of each other. And that life lesson was show those you love that you love them while they are here. Um, because I hadn't seen that between them. And my mother died a year after my father, right. So life lessons learned, right. Good topic for us someday. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. life lessons. And, and, you know, appreciating that, June, that sometimes I know for me, uh, when my mom passed away in 2008, I'm an only child. It felt like, oh my God, oh my God. But I have lived such a full life with my mother that I, I really cherish mm -hmm. and treasure those moments that we spent together. And if I was, and remember I say grief is not linear when we started talking it can come like a wheel wind. it can be like a circle it can be like a spiral there are times when I sit here like I sit here right here where I'm sitting at right now and I I long for my for my mom um being here this is my friend Dara <laughs> who most of you know um I long for her being here for for witnessing with me what I am at today and and that's a different kind of grieving because she didn't get to see my unfolding right and so I grieve that that she could have been my witness to something like you know like owning a house right from a person that came and moved all the time that she could have witnessed that so mm -hmm. such a treasure right so sometimes that comes and I see it and it's like, oh yeah, there you are. How are you? You haven't visited me in a long time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a gentle reminder of the connection that we have, right? Someone else. And it's not looking at the time, it's 9.30. Okay, I'll, I'll just say briefly, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, life lessons. Uh, what came up for me too is um, last year I lost my husband, and six months before that I lost my brother. So, and a lot of other losses, COVID and health, thing, but you know, huge, huge losses for me. So, I've been through a very turbulent year. But now I'm in calmer waters, and I know that the grief will still be there, but the at times, and one of the things that you had said that's really important is I really, I welcomed it. You know, I wanted to feel it because I knew that was the only way I was going to get through this. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, one of the greatest lessons my husband gave to me 
he lived his life till the day he died. He was weak in his bed. And the week before he died, he said, let's start a book club because <laughs> he loved reading. Mm-hmm. And but he lived his life. He embraced his life till the day he died. And that got me through his dying as well. So what a wonderful life lesson he gave me. Mm. And um, so I cherish that and I hold that. And it's nice because I can still speak with him. (laughs) When I really need to check in at times, what do you think, Steve? (laughs) So, you know, it's, I think with grief for me, the people I've lost, I can still, they're in my heart and they'll be in my heart forever. So I can still contact them. Yeah. Thank you. I, Thank you so much. I partnered with Lenore and it was, it was helpful in that I, one of, I was just aware of listening to you, um, Isabel, of the many uh, different griefs, um, but the one that stood out was anticipatory grief because I've been dealing with cancer for so many years. And um, and it's always up and down and it goes, it stops for a little while and then it grows again. But it's there all the time. And so it's the anticipatory grief of losing my, my um, life as well as for my husband in losing our marriage. Um, So hearing Lenore speak of living every moment right to the end, which is what um, I'm always trying to do. And it's been 12 years and I'm still going. Um, We just had a lovely vacation together, but it, (laughs) you know, the cancer is just um, always up in the air. Um, so it's anticipatory for both myself and my husband that I find myself dealing with. And it was very helpful to hear Lenore speak of her experience with uh, loss of her husband. Yeah, Nancy, thank you. And, and that's the important piece about grief. Grief is not meant to be carried alone. It's really meant to be shared. And yet, it's a very private thing. When we are grieving, I know that I didn't want to tell people I was grieving about my mom because I didn't want to burden them. Mm. And I think this as a helper group, how liberating it is to be able, look, we just did like two minutes each of just having someone witness us, not give us advice, not tell us what to do with it, but just witness, just keep us company and sometimes that just can open up another place for us it can bring us forward to another place right like you know fully know it's oh wow this person will always be there um you know and and i really want to emphasize that our own relationship with grief, our personal relationship with grief, right? It's gonna color how we are towards other people when them when they bring grief to us, right? Are we just gonna like address it superficially, not really getting it? We need to get in it just in the same way we to any other thing, depression, anxiety. We got to get in there. We got to get our hands in it. Uh, You can't make um, bread without getting your hands. I don't make bread, but I think it's true. You can't make bread without getting your hands in it, in the door, right? And uh, or whatever it is, or pizza without, right? Getting it in there. Um, And it's just such a, a, it's a beautiful honoring way. It is an honoring that takes place when we are in it in that way. Um, Not that that's not suffering, right? Because that's not true. And so I'll take one more and then I wanna share something from Titna Ha around grief. 
that I think will be helpful. And then one last thing, which will be a movement. I Go guess, ahead, Rachel. I see you. I, I that what came something that came for me is this this quote that was somebody quoted in high school um, from John Greenleaf Whittier. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. And I think like that's the kind of grief that I have always been, I guess, afraid of or in relationship with. And that's n not such a defined grief or an easy one to, um, to, I guess, to be with or to know how to get any comfort with it. Um, but the losses of things that are like there's so many years left of living, but there are certain things that will never be like never having children or never having never having a certain kind of love or like the diminished possibility of certain things and the um, sort of needing to give up the same energy of hoping for them because it's it's like this diminished, you know, like a Charlie Brown thing, which each time he thinks he's going to hit the foot, kick the football. And at a certain point, wisdom has to set in. You're not kicking the football, my friend. Just get a chiropractor. Just lay on the ground and do legs up the wall or something, Charlie Brown. So that is a kind of grief that feels like un sort of unresolvable if it was the end if I knew like this was the end of my life and there was all this loss but knowing that there's still miles to go and with this loss of things that won't be fulfilled mm, I don't know if anyone else want to speak to that but Rachel thank you that is another grief that I don't think we mentioned and is that what if the it could have been, what if I done this? Mm, thank you for that. That's a big one. I could speak to that. This is Jane. Is there time? Hello? Go ahead, Jane. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I was thinking, Rachel, before you spoke that, that one anticipatory loss, I guess, or it's actually not so anticipatory, is that I'm old and um, and the years go by so much faster than they did before, apparently. And I'm not gonna, you know, when is, it's gonna come sooner than later, even if I wanna think it's 20 years or 15 years or whatever. And um, it's, you know, I, I'm not, I won't, what are they gonna say at my memorial service? I haven't accomplished anything, you know? So it's like, it's all the things you mentioned, Rachel, but it's the, it's like this whole package of, of I don't want to leave the party. I'm having too good a time. And um, yeah, there's a lot of grief around that, I think. A lot of fear too. But I love this process. That's really what I wanted to say, Isabel. Thank you so much. For the, whole, the whole process, the, the whole morning. I wanted to say that that also, Isabel, that such an important subject, an important process. And I love the poem about um, grief not being biodegradable, but it did running through your fingers. And I, I thought about um, Robert Stollero, a psychoanalyst who wrote about his, his waking up and his wife was finding his wife dead. Um, in his bed and the feeling of the grief being being in a different universe than other people. And I think that's a quality of grief, that it feels like you're in a different place uh, than the people living their ordinary lives. And it's it's the grief of what what Stalaro called the the um, certitudes of everyday life, like what you expect. And grief is like, well, I couldn't expect that. Um, that. That happened and how could that happen? 
And all of the grief seems to have that in common, like how could it be? And then it, then you have the questioning of well, all the things I take for granted uh, in life, uh, uh, the, how can I take them for granted? And we need that certitude, those certitudes of everyday life. And so when they're when they're broken, and we sort of see through, oh well, life is unpredictable. There's a there's a grief about that. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so one of just a few things around grief and, and to do with it, I think that someone here said it, there's wisdom in the loss and seeing that and recognizing that is important. Movement is important. Whether you dance, you walk, nature is important, connecting with nature connecting with those things that you love. And I'm going to read this um, from Thich Nhat Hanh around grief. When the cloud is no longer in the sky, it doesn't mean the cloud has died. The cloud is continuing other forms like rain or snow or ice. Mm -hmm. So you can recognize your, um, your cloud in her new form. If you are very fond of a beautiful cloud, and if your cloud is no longer there, you should not be sad. Your beloved cloud may have come, may have become the rain calling on you. Darling, darling, don't you see me in the new form? And then you will not be stuck with grief and despair. Your beloved one continues always. Your beloved one continues always. Thank you so much. I think we are a minute over appreciating. And again, this was a hatchpatch of many different pieces, but also the importance of us as helper recognizing when we ourselves are holding grief and um, that we can really set it down. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Isabel. And we hope to see you again on another holiday when you can join us. Thank you.